us. Dr. Michael Skolin is a uh, associate professor of psychology and neuroscience here at Baylor University. He completed his PhD at Washington University in St. Louis and also has a postdoctoral fellowship from Emory University School of Medicine. He has published over 80 articles and received grants from the National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Health and Industry. His sleep research has been covered broadly by media agencies, including Good Morning America, Fox and Friends, NPR, BBC Radio, Wired, and Time. And at Baylor University, Dr. Skolan has received the Newsmaker of the Year Award for Research and the Elizabeth Vardaman Award for Undergraduate Mentorship. Dr. Skolan, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Ryan. I'm so excited to be here today. I'm so excited to share with you uh, some of what we've learned about sleep science. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and is everything looking good, Ryan? You can take that as a yes. Yep. So I think that sleep is one of the most fascinating topics in all of sciences. And there's so many different directions that we can go. There's so many different areas of interest. So for example, did you know that humans can be asleep for a full hour and not even realize that they ever slept? This is absolutely true. So I used to run these studies of afternoon napping and we'd be recording brain waves and we'd see that someone was asleep for like 90 minutes straight and they'd get up and they say, oh, I'm really sorry I wasn't able to take a nap today. Maybe I can try again another week. Like, we were looking at your brain waves. You were absolutely asleep. What is going on here? There's even more salient cases. There's even something called paradoxical insomnia in which people uh, will sleep for eight hours a night, but they will think that they never slept at all. So there's some mystery to science. How about this one? Animal sleep is also really interesting, such as dolphins. Dolphins will only sleep with half of their brains at a time. And that allows them to keep on swimming. Uh, it allows them to go up to the surface for air and to avoid predators all while asleep. And in fact, really all Cretaceans do this. So orcas, fur seals, and so forth. What's really interesting to me is that new parents show something similar. Now, it's not quite as dramatic as in dolphins where like half the brain is awake, half the brain is asleep. But there are some areas of the brain that are really active when you're awake and like really suppressed when you're asleep that stay kind of active when new moms and new dads are asleep. And I, I'm sure some of you out there are nodding. You like know this, like you kind of remained vigilant even in your sleep for your newborn. How about one more? Did you know that if you took a group of animals, a, a group of rodents, for example, and you continuously deprive them of sleep just every single night, that 100% of those rodents would end up dying within two to three weeks, 100%. That's the same amount of time it takes for continual food deprivation to result in death. So all these facts, when you, you just introduce to sleep within a couple of minutes, come to the conclusion that sleep must be doing something really important. This was captured in a famous speech given at a medical conference a number of decades ago, where Alan Rechtschafen said, if sleep is not serving an absolutely vital function, it's gotta be the biggest mistake the evolutionary process has ever made. Think of this, what other part of behavior or of just living in general would involve you spending a quarter to a third of your lives doing something that's not gathering resources, it's not leading to transferring of your, your genes to the next generation. And on top of that all, you are your eyes are closed and you're literally paralyzed at some parts of, of the night. So you're really vulnerable to predators. If sleep is not doing something absolutely vital for you, then, then something's wrong. But, some, but sleep is doing several things that are important. And given that, given that logic, you would think that uh, everyone would say, oh, sleep is great. You know, I make it a priority every single day, every single night. I've got a good bedtime. I have good sleep hygiene. It's such a priority. But when you survey the American public, American adults, 
what you find is that only about 10% of American adults currently say that sleep is a priority. And part of the reason I like to do events like this is I want to, I want to move that needle just a little bit. My, my goal is to bump up sleep on people's priority list today. Let's see, let's see how I do about that. All right, well, before you get into that level, you gotta assess how are people sleeping in general? And we've looked at sleep in lots of different populations, general public, some patients, but we're also really interested in student sleep, specifically Baylor student sleep. And this is a project that I've done with Jason McGregor. He's um, in, a, in the accounting department and he and I have um, had Baylor students wear these devices called active watches for, you know, the last five years we've been doing this research. And I have to watch you wear it like a, a wristband, you wear it as a wristband. And it's kind of like a Fitbit, except the major difference is your Fitbits don't actually work in telling you how much sleep you get. They'll give you numbers and everything, they're just wrong. These are clinical grade, clinical grade, they actually work. And they give you data that look like this, where every single day is a different row. And what I've done is mark down what for a student, would be an excellent bedtime, 11 p.m. Whenever a student tells me they go to bed before midnight, I feel like it's a little bit of a win. 11 p.m. would be fantastic for a student. And then a wake up time of 8 a.m. would also be fantastic. That's not when they need to be in class. They need to be asleep or just waking up from sleep. Okay, so what active watches do is they distingu distinguish when you're just resting, that's teal or this sort of aqua color, and when you're actually asleep. And here's the, the graph from a single student. And this single student is an all-star sleeper. I want all Baylor students to be like this. They're averaging eight hours a night, uh, really consistent bedtimes, really consistent wake times. They're fantastic. The problem is that only 6% of Baylor students actually look like this. And even if you like change the threshold for like what sleep should really be in college and say, well, if we could just get them like seven hours a night, just on average, just barely seven hours, maybe seven hours in one minute. Even that doesn't look very good. Like not even half of Baylor students are currently getting seven hours of sleep. What you more often see is something that looks like this. Cutting back on sleep, cutting back on sleep, cutting back on sleep, and then especially during finals week, you might see something like this, the almighty all-nighter. Turns out that's not such a good idea. Maybe when you were a Baylor student, you pulled some of these, maybe some of you didn't. Um, maybe some of you pull them and look back and say, I wish I didn't. Maybe some of you at the end of this talk will say, oh my gosh, I haven't thought about that too much, but yeah, maybe that wasn't such a great idea. Not everyone's pulling all-nighters, and certainly if you do, it's not an every week fair. What we more often see in students and the general public is something called yo-yo sleep. So this is where you cut back on sleep, cut back on sleep, rebound, cut back on sleep, rebound, cut back on sleep, rebound. Uh, think of this as the work week. You're cutting back on sleep Monday through Friday, and then come the weekend, you're sleeping in. No big deal, right? I'm going to average seven hours of sleep. Well, one of my students who graduated in 2016, Claudina Tammy, she did a study on this. And what she discovered that even when you account for how much total sleep people get across the week, if they're yo-yoing back and forth, that's associated with decreased cognition, decreased creativity, and decreases in mood. So it seems to be really important. And Heck, Claudine is really smart. She went off to medical school and now she's doing her fellowship at Johns Hopkins. So we should, uh, we should listen to her. Outside of our laboratory, um, many sleep labs across the country are doing really great work that I wanna highlight. One of them is showing that losing sleep increases your risk for respiratory infections. Isn't this something that mom always told us, right? Like if you're not eating right and you're not sleeping right, you're gonna catch a cold. That's absolutely true. They've shown it in many studies. Some of them are experimental. Um, which there's kind of a side note there. I don't know if you'd ever wanna be a participant in one of these studies. 
it, it would involve like moving into a hotel for two weeks straight and half of the participants get normal sleep. So they get seven or eight hours of sleep a night. And then the other half is forced to get five hours a night. And midway through, this is the part you wouldn't want to be involved in, everyone gets injected with a rhinovirus because the researchers were interested in who then becomes symptomatic versus whose bodies, whose immune systems are able to fight off that cold. And what they discovered, this was so important, what they discovered was that if you were restricting sleep to five hours a night, then you were four times as likely to catch a cold at the end of that study. Sleep is very important for your immune system. Sleep is also really important for athletic performance. This has been shown in a few domains, but one that I thought was really interesting, the, um, this was done at Stanford about a decade ago. They got the basketball team to get one more hour of sleep every single night. And what they showed was that shooting percentage went up 10% with the largest effects for hitting more free throws. Maybe Scott Drew wants to give me a call. And finally, you know, this one speaks a little bit more to the college student audience, but there's really actually something to the concept of beauty sleep. They've done these studies where, uh, again, you probably wouldn't want to be a participant in, in these studies, but you would either pull an all-nighter and then take a selfie, or you'd get good sleep and then take a selfie. And then they took your photos, showed them to other uh, individuals who rated levels of attractiveness, and sure enough, after a night of good sleep, those photos were rated as being more physically attractive than those where they had been cutting back or they had pulled an all-nighter. I find all of that interesting, but I'm a neuroscientist, I'm a psychologist, so I'm interested in what is sleep doing to the brain? And just as losing sleep is hard on the body, it is absolutely hard on the brain. What I've done here is highlighted all the different regions of the brain that are significantly negatively affected by just cutting back on sleep um, acutely. So like for a couple of days, you know, fairly dramatically, like, oh, I only got three hours of sleep or I, I pulled in all nighter. Or by cutting back mildly, like six hours, five hours for a long stretch of time it results in the same effect. And we don't need to learn like any specific neuroanatomy here, you probably just wondering, okay, what do these brain regions do? And I wanna highlight three different areas or three different functions. One of them, maybe you could have guessed, this frontal lobe is really important to sustaining attention and to um, allowing you to reason at a really high intellectual level. Some of these regions are very important to regulating our emotional responses, regulating how, how stressed we get and how we respond to stressors. And then others are really important to learning and memory. So let's go through these in turn. And for the first one, I wanna show you um, a video. It's, it's really maybe my favorite news report of all time. It's, of course, it has to do with sleep. Uh, Ron Claiborne at ABC News was a little skeptical that sleep deprivation could affect your attention sufficiently that it would have actually affect your driving. So he put it to the test on himself. So let me go ahead and start this. Two consecutive hours. I've hit the proverbial wall. I've almost been up 24 hours. Hi, I'm Ron Claiborne. Then I traveled to the Liberty Mutual Research Institute outside of Boston, where they study the effects of sleep deprivation on driving. It can happen in the blink of an eye. Chronic lack of sleep fogs the mind, makes people more likely to make mistakes at school or work. It makes us emotionally volatile and more prone to illness. At the research lab, I was hooked up to a brain wave monitor and a device that tracks eye movement. I feel okay now, um, but not great. Then I got behind the wheel of a minivan. As tired as I was, I thought I would be okay. We'll see, we'll see. I feel like I can drive pretty well. Then I started driving on a closed track with a researcher sitting next to me who could step on an emergency brake if things went awry. I'm feeling pretty, pretty worn out. Soon I was becoming sleepier and sleepier. It became a struggle to keep my eyes open and just to hold my head up. 
Before long, I was experiencing micro-sleep. I look like a normal awake driver, but what you can't tell is that my brain is actually asleep. About half an hour in, it became more obvious. I had fallen asleep at the wheel and driven completely off the road. That was not good. I soon realized I just couldn't go on. Fuck. Yeah, I'm done. Okay, let's throw it into park then. Good idea. It was just too dangerous. That was tough. Back in the lab, Dr. Seisler showed me just what was going on inside my brain while I was driving. Yes, this is evidence okay. that you're falling asleep. My eyes were open, but see how these lines are becoming more jagged. That's sleep coming on. And these lines show my blinking is getting slower. And what about when I drove off the road? We could see it coming in your brainwave. Looking at the chart here, how long was my micro sleep in this one episode. So in this one episode, we're talking about one, two, three, four, five or six seconds. What was most shocking, Dr. Seisler said, I fell asleep. I micro slept 21 other times. You had dozens of times where your eyes began rolling around in their sockets. This would happen for two, three, four seconds. You'd get a couple of good rolls in. If I'd been driving 60 miles an hour, I would have gone the length of a football field asleep. We started off today by noting that people can fall asleep for a full hour. They can fall asleep for eight hours even and not quite realize it. So why should we be shocked that you could fall asleep for a few seconds and not realize it? Uh, we have some estimates on the impact of drowsy driving and the best estimates we have are that it explains about 16 to 17% of fatal car crashes. These are really meaningful. All right, so that's attention. Let's talk a little bit about how in cutting back on sleep, just life doesn't feel quite as good. Why is that the case? And to hit at these, I wanna tell you about two honors theses, two undergraduate honors theses that were done in my lab in the past few years. This first one was done by Stacy Wynn. And what she did was she recruited adults and she had them um, <clears throat> either sleep normally Monday through Friday. So they were getting seven and a half hours of sleep on average or restrict their sleep to six hours a night, Monday until Friday something that we've all done, right? Like that's no big deal. I'm just getting six hours a night, you know, I need seven, but no big deal. Well, the first thing that Stacy did was she just gave them assessments of mood. So like, how are they feeling? Are they feeling angry? Are they feeling happy? And so forth, things like that. And what you wanna be is like low on the scale. The higher you are on the scale, the more mood disturbances you're having, the more negative mood you're having. You can see at baseline, before there's any normal sleep or restricted sleep, everyone's kind of the same. The two groups are the same. But after just four nights of mild sleep restriction, we found a significant increase in that sleep restricted group. Uh, moodiness went up about 20%. And we've seen that in several studies. So with less sleep, you are moodier. Now that was an interesting finding, uh, but that's actually not what got Stacy Wynn's thesis uh, published in, in JAMA Surgery. What Stacy also did in the study was she had participants read medical error vignettes. So if you see this picture, can you pick out what's wrong with it? This is called a retained surgical instrument. Basically the surgical team went in, they did their job, except for one thing, they forgot to take something out. This actually happens 500 to 1,000 times every single year in the United States. Even though they've instituted checklists, this stuff still happens. So Stacy had participants read vignettes like this about like retained surgical instruments or other things and asked participants, well, how bad do you think this error is? How serious? And you know, the two groups were kind of the same on that. But then she asked a few other questions. She asked, how much should the doctor be punished for making this mistake? And how much should the patient be compensated 
for making this mistake. And what she found is that if you're well rested, you're getting seven to eight hours of sleep every night, uh, very few people think that the doctor deserves the absolute maximum punishment or that the patient should be compensated you know, the absolute maximum amount. But if you've been cutting back on sleep just a little bit, six hours a night, all of a sudden, these numbers quadruple. With sleep loss, we are more willing to punish others for their mistakes. The second thesis, this one was completed just this spring by Kyla Ferguson, who's off to Baylor College of Medicine next week. She had a very similar design where half of, of the adult participants got to sleep normally, about seven and a half hours of sleep on average, Monday through Friday. And half of them restricted their sleep to six hours a night on average. But instead of reading about medical errors, um, Kyla was really interested in religiosity uh, religious um, perceptions, uh, religious behaviors, and how we assess others' moral mistakes. So instead of reading about doctors and like retained surgical instruments, she had participants read about um, Christian pastors who have made moral mistakes. And, and all of these are like true stories. So like pastor uh, stealing from the church or, um, you know, committing adultery, uh, in some cases of like murder, really bad stuff, right? Like, so, so there was a mix of, of severity. And she asked participants, so how severe do you think this is? And they, you know, both groups were kind of saying, oh, it's, they're all pretty bad, right? But then Kyla asked, should this person be forgiven? What do you think? What she found is that with just a little bit of mild sleep restriction. And I should pause here and say that all of these participants uh, identify as Christians and they go to church three or four times every single month. They identify as moderately to highly religious. So these are individuals who really identify as uh, not cultural Christians, but you know, really devoted Christians with just a mild a bit mild levels of sleep restriction they felt that these people were a little less likely to be forgiven that they were a little less deserving of forgiveness now if that's all there was i'd say oh my gosh you know we we got to pay attention to this but kyla included another question she had them also rate how likely do you think this person is to now get into heaven? And what she found is that with the mild levels of sleep restriction, now we had more people switching their ratings from somewhat likely to not very likely. I think that this is really important. Uh, I think it it reflects on some of some of our you know dynamic changes in forgiveness and how punishing we want to be and, and how outrage and or, so forth. What we really want to do with this research is take it into um, participants who are pastors, who are church leaders, and see whether we get you know, basically the same pattern, in which case it's like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, we really got to pay attention to sleep health amongst church, and we just haven't been doing that. We're beginning to focus a little more on mental health, but not enough to sleep health. Or, of course, the alternative is that with years of training, then maybe you're not as affected by sleep restriction. We'll only find with, um, with more studies, and uh, Ryan brought up the, the great point about donations. This is not a project that gets funded by NSF or NIH. This is the type of project that depends on uh, donations or, or foundations. Let's talk a little bit about learning and memory. This is actually the area that initially got me interested in sleep. And certainly, sleep and learning and memory are, are strongly related in college students, in all students. Uh, we've been running this study uh, as part of the new to BU survey. So something that students do in their first month at Baylor. And we 
just ask a single question about sleep. How many hours of sleep are you getting on most weekday nights? And what we're finding here is that, oh gosh, there's a lot of students who aren't sleeping very well off the bat, like very few are sleeping optimally, but about half of students aren't even getting the minimum seven hours um, that's recommended. And it seems to really matter because when we track their GPA across that first semester, we see that they're doing significantly worse than the students who are off to a good start in sleeping well. I mean, you say, well, you know, there's so many things that could be contributing to this. Yeah, okay. We've looked at, is it their high school grades? No. Is it like their SAT scores? No. Is it something about their gender, their race, ethnicity, if they're first generation? Or not? No. Well, if some students are, are employed full time, that, that's really hard. Yeah, it is. But that's, these effects are over and above that. And by the way, it's not just in the first semester. We see it in the second semester and, and three semesters in the future and four semesters in the future. And it might last longer than that. We just don't have the data yet for that. And then how about this? If you're a short sleeper in that first month of college, that doubles your risk for at some point in your Baylor career landing on academic probation. This is an important early signal. But why? What's going on while you're sleeping in your brain that makes it so important that you get good sleep for your learning and memory? That's one of the foundational reasons that we have the Sleep Neuroscience and Cognition Lab. People come into our lab, we've kind of designed it to be hotel-like. Uh, they, they stay uh, overnight in our beds. We attach them to something called polysomnography. Saw some of it in the video. You attach electrodes to the scalp, uh, to muscles like the chin muscle beside the eyes to look at eye movements. And then people fall asleep. By the way, they sleep great in our lab. In fact, they sleep better in our lab than they do at home. You put people in a comfy bed in a dark room, a dark room that's cool, and you remove all their electronics. People sleep fantastic. They've been averaging eight hours and 15 minutes of sleep in our lab. Um, you know, since we started lab like five years, six years ago. Here's what we see. So this might all look like squiggly lines, but you don't need to be a neuroscientist to say that that section on the right looks really different than the section on the left. With polysomnography, you know the moment that someone has fallen asleep. And you can also distinguish different stages of sleep. So here's a, a view of REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, where the, the brain, the brain waves are kind of all crazy. Like you have big stuff like this and then small stuff like that and then fast ones and then slower ones. Um, it's really chaotic. Kind of like our dreams are chaotic, right? This is when we're dreaming. Another interesting thing about REM sleep is that uh, your eyes literally are moving rapidly under, under the eyelid. So that's, of course, why it's called rapid eye movement sleep. But the most interesting thing is if you look at any muscle in the body, other than uh, those involved in like breathing and you know, you know, your heart, you are paralyzed. And the reason you're paralyzed is so that you don't act out your dreams. That would be really bad, right? Like if you're dreaming of fighting off pirates on a ship and you got to dive down in the water, you probably don't want to actually be doing that in real life. So your body is going to paralyze you. Um, some people, when they wake up, they experience sleep paralysis. Uh, so they're awake, but they can't move. That's a signal that some of their REM sleep is intruding on their wakefulness. And normally it resolves as you get older. Normally it resolves after a couple of minutes, but it's certainly terrifying for those who don't know what's happening. The part of sleep that I'm most interested in is something called slow wave sleep. It's called slow wave because, hey, these waves are really slow. But if you just look at them, you see how synchronized they are across the brain. You see the waves are all sort of going up and going down and at the same time. And that indicates that large regions of the brain are all firing at once and then all quieting down. Firing at once and all quieting down turns out to be very, very important for things like forming memories. 
And we discovered in the 90s that that is just what's happening during slow wave sleep. So back in the 1990s, there was a scientist at MIT and he was looking at learning in rodents. He was just looking at how single cells in the brain indicate whether you learn something or not. So he'd take a rodent and he'd let it run a maze and he'd find that certain cells would fire in different parts of the maze and it represented that they were learning. Matt Wilson discovered that those same cells that were firing as you're initially learning replayed themselves when those rodents fell asleep. And I, this is incredible. It's like, you know, we go to sleep to help consolidate the things that we learn during the day. Because during the day, there's so much interference. There's so many things that can cause forgetting. Sleep is like a safe time for this consolidation process to occur. And it turned out he was right because he ran these control experiments where, um, where like rodents didn't get to learn the maze initially, but they still, and so they didn't show the replay. Or he showed that if you go in and knock out this replay with these like sophisticated techniques, the rodents look like they've never seen the maze before the next day. And more recently he's shown that if you accelerate this replay, if you cause it to happen more when you're sleeping, the rodents look like experts at the maze the following day. So if you hear all that, like, goodness, so, so all this stuff on like sleep being important for memory. And, and by the way, that's been shown in rodents, but our lab and many other labs across the country have connected the dots in humans as, as well. One of the things you might be wondering is, well, how does this relate to medicine? How does this relate to memory disorders? And, you know, my, my mom had Alzheimer's disease or, or my grandparent or an uncle or an aunt or sister. And one of the things that we realized uh, a few years ago was that there had been all these studies that were done on like different aspects of health. They happen to include questions about sleep. And then they followed people over time to see how did their memory functioning change over time? Did anyone get Alzheimer's disease? And there were like all these studies that have been done that show that short sleep in middle age or fragmented sleep in middle age predicts faster decline of memory and greater rates of Alzheimer's disease. Like this is of course like a big deal because anything that you can modify, whether you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, or 70s, that's going to help pre preserve your functioning and your brain health over a long period of time. Like, we should do that, right? So maybe this is about like memory consolidation. Maybe it's about how, you know, sleep loss affects your frontal lobe and different parts of your brain. That's definitely part of the story. But now we have additional layers where we've been able to connect the micro mechanisms of these diseases to what's happening in sleep. If, if you've known anyone who's had Alzheimer's disease, if you've been affected by that at all, my family's been, been affected by that, you've probably heard the term plaques and tangles. These are considered sort of like the biological causes of Alzheimer's disease. And if you've heard of things like plaques, which end up in like causing cell death, you may have heard the term beta amyloid. Amyloid is something that like aggregates over long periods of time to form the plaques, which then cause Alzheimer's disease. Well, it turns out that at this very moment, I have a fair amount of amyloid in my brain and you do too. Every single person on this call, and you know what, all of the students on this campus, they all have some amyloid in their brains. What differs across people is how well brains can clear out the amyloid. See, amyloid just builds up as a function of like your brain working. Just like you rev a, a car engine, it's gonna put off some exhaust. There's gonna be some waste product to the engine working. The same thing with the brain and with amyloid. But a really healthy brain is gonna clear out that amyloid. Question is, how does it do that? And when does it do that? And that led to the recent discovery of the glymphatic system. 
If you've heard of the lymphatic system, that's the body's ability to clear out waste products. But we had no idea how the brain did it. The same mechanisms didn't apply. But um, this scientist up in Rochester, uh, Mike Niedergard, she discovered that there is a system in the brain that operates kind of like plumbing. If you're a plumber and you want to clean out a pipe, you flush it with some fast fluid, right? With fluid velocity, helps clean out that pipe. Same thing is happening in our brains every single night, where there is an increase of about 60% of the velocity of fluid deep through the levels, deep through the um, layers of our brain. And the consequence, the positive consequence, is it washes out metabolites that build up during the day, including beta amyloid. And this happens during sleep, perhaps uh, primarily during slow wave sleep. We're still trying to connect those dots. This was well established in animal models several years ago, but just this year, just in 2021, was it proven that the same system is occurring in humans and that when you uh, deprive humans of sleep, their brains are not clearing out metabolites at nearly the same rate. And at this point, you're probably wondering, how do I improve my sleep? <laughs> I am I'm convinced I don't want to be in uh, the 90% who think sleep's not a priority. I want to be in that 10% and I want to increase the number of Americans who view sleep as a priority. How do I change my behavior tonight to improve my sleep? Some of you might be thinking, oh, I want to change but that's so hard. you don't know my situation. Like I, it's, it's really, really hard for me to sleep. I hear you. And I'm going to try and touch on that. And let me first just try to connect that. I understand how difficult it can be to get good sleep. I'm a parent of, of two kids. Uh, Jack was you know born almost five years ago now. And, and Abby was a pandemic baby. She was born one month into the, the pandemic. So she's a little over a year now. And uh, they're sleeping beautifully here, but <laughs> as any parent knows, um, children don't do that normally. Like it's really hard to get good sleep as, as a new parent. Now here's some newer photos. Isn't she a little princess? That was on our one year birthday. Okay, so first off, let me tell you how we've gone like proof of concept that you can change your sleep behaviors even in really tough times. We've done that in students. A number of years ago, a professor in the interior design department and I, we've worked together on several projects, and we were just lamenting that we would teach our students about the importance of sleep, but they just wouldn't change anything they were doing. So I was like, what could we do? Finals week is coming up. Um, we don't want all our students just pulling all-nighters left and right. What can we do to get them good sleep? And so we devised this challenge we went in, we told our students, if you can prove by wearing an active watch, if you can prove that you have slept an average of eight hours a night throughout finals week without any all-nighters, then we will award you eight extra credit points on your final exam. We had no idea how this would turn out. We didn't know if anyone would take this, whether anyone would attempt it, if anyone would be successful. Um, during finals week, students average around six hours of sleep a night, and almost none of them are getting optimal levels of sleep. But what we found out is that if you incentivize sleep, if you incentivize people to increase where sleep is on their priority list, you almost completely eliminate short sleep. You almost completely get rid of that stuff that we know is really detrimental to learning and memory and overall health and almost half of students can be fully successful at this, can get a full eight hours of sleep a night. Of course, all students wanna know is, all right, but what about my grades? Like if I'm sleeping more, certainly I'm not studying as well or I'm not studying as much and so my test grades are gonna suffer. Uh-uh, no way. Even if you control for things like how they're doing in the class before the final exam, we find that the more that students are sleeping during finals week, via this challenge, 
the better they do on their final exam. And also the more um, sleep consistency. So this is like, people are not yo-yoing here. People are yo-yoing a lot here. We find that they're doing better if they're sleeping consist consistently. And one other thing you might see from this graph is that we know that there are achievement gaps between underrepresented minority students and comparison students. But if you put people on the same playing field with sleep, you see those achievement gaps are narrowed considerably. All right, so maybe I can't offer y'all any extra credit to get you to sleep better tonight. But what I can do is give you a toolbox of things that you can begin doing today that maybe you haven't thought about before, maybe you haven't thought about enough before, begin doing it today, and you're going to experience better sleep tonight and for the rest of the week and hopefully you know, the rest of the year and beyond. First thing I want for you to do is be super mindful of light exposure. Get 15 or 20 or so minutes of natural light exposure every single morning. You see, our brains need that to set our internal clocks of when we should be feeling alert and when we should be feeling sleepy. This is really important, and I think you're going to see some immediate effects. And just as you got to be mindful of light exposure during the day, getting more of it, natural light exposure, that is, you got to minimize that unnatural light at night. I, we've all heard this, right? And it's just like, don't look at your smartphone at night and, okay, thank you. That's smart. You know, I'll do night mode or something. Okay. I know that I'm not going to get people to not have smartphones and all that stuff in bed, but please do something. Like, don't fall asleep with the TV on. That continual exposure to light, you don't know that it's actually fragmenting your, well, what it does is it changes your sleep quality from, being as deep as it can possibly be to being in lighter stages of sleep throughout the night. And people wake up and they're not quite as refreshed as they could be. And it's, it's hard for people to see that in themselves until they remove that unnatural light at night. And then they start waking up and like, oh, I feel more refreshed. Life is good again. Coffee. Coffee is fantastic. I love coffee. I have it every single morning. Keep on drinking your coffee in the morning. Um, try to avoid it in, in the afternoon. And after 5 p.m., say, no, thanks. Um, maybe decaf, but even that, you know, be careful with. The half-life of caffeine is actually a lot longer than you'd expect. There's been placebo-controlled studies where people had caffeine as late or as, yeah, as late as, 5 p.m. and then they tracked their sleep that night with polysomnography and they showed that relative to a placebo that people were having more difficulty falling asleep and more importantly getting less slow wave sleep that night. So if you're getting into one of those habits I really encourage you to, to really try to break it. Really try to move your caffeine to the morning hours. Uh, a lot of people ask well what about naps? Are naps good or are naps bad? It's hard to give you a definitive answer on that. The question is, what is the impact of that nap? If it's just an occasional nap, you know, once every few months, no big deal. Keep having those naps, that's great. But if you're finding that you're like sitting down on the couch or in your comfy chair and you're falling asleep, napping once or twice a day, I really encourage you to, when you're feeling sleepy, use that as a signal of, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go for a little stroll. Um, physical exercise does help with sleep and removing some of those naps can often help people get better quality sleep at night. Uh, music listening is kind of a new topic that we've been interested in and it's you can't really say music listening is good or music listening is bad. Some music listening is good unless you're someone who's experiencing a lot of earworm. Earworms are where you get something stuck in your head and it just kind of rattles over and over and over and over again. And we just published a paper about a month ago that showed that when people are listening to a lot of music, they're much more likely to get earworms when they're trying to fall asleep. And if you're getting an earworm when you're trying to fall asleep, it's more difficult to fall asleep. It takes you longer to fall asleep. You wake up more at night 
and you're spending more of your time asleep in light stages rather than in deep stages. And finally, one more tip. I love this tip. This was a study that was done by Hannah Ballard a few years ago, and she's going to be uh, working on her PhD very soon. Um, if you're like me, uh, sometimes you get into bed and it's like, that's when my head turns on. That's when like the thoughts are there, they're swirling, I can't get them out. Well, there's actually a trick to stopping that that seems counterintuitive. And that's taking out a piece of paper and writing down everything that's on your mind. Sometimes it's called a worry list because a lot of people are worrying at night. Write down all those words. One of the things that can weigh on your mind is your to-do list. Maybe you don't even realize it's weighing on your mind, but it is. And so we ran the study where people for five minutes before bed wrote on a pad of paper, everything that was on their to-do list. And we found that doing that for five minutes, people fell asleep 37% faster than they would have otherwise. And the more they wrote down, the more they got everything on paper, offloaded all those thoughts, the faster they fell asleep. It's a great trick. I really encourage you to try it. It's something that, that I, I do. I keep a pad of paper by my bedside in case I wake up in the middle of the night or I can't fall asleep initially. And that brings me to a close. Thank you so much for your attention. I'd be happy to uh, now answer any questions you may have. And we do have uh, a handful of questions that came through, Dr. Skolan, and, and thanks again for, for sharing all of that. Uh, I'm going to run through the list and, um, you know, please keep those, keep those coming in. Uh, one of these you kind of just touched on, but I'll, I'll ask it so that, you know, perhaps you might expand the specifics of it. We had an attendee ask if you have specific recommendations for people who have a hard time winding down at night. Yeah, well... The first thing you got to know, you got to figure out is how much of that could be driven by work. A lot of folks now with phones and your email is constantly in your hands, you're constantly reachable. A lot of people have difficulty in setting boundaries on when their work hours are and when they're not. For me personally, that boundary is dinner time. As soon as I sit down for dinner time, it is no more work unless I get like an emergency call if something's happening in the middle of the night with a sleep lab, which rarely happens. But um, that's my boundary. And I encourage people to have a similar boundary. It's a really great event boundary. You know, sitting down for dinner, I'm going to be with my family. And then the rest of my night is about me and relaxing and being with my family. So I'd encourage you to start with that, really draw strong boundaries and then incorporate some bedtime writing to help to offload those thoughts. Write out everything that you might be worried about, write out everything that's on your to-do list, or if your thoughts don't have anything to do with them, maybe they have to do with, I don't know, music or, or your sports team or something, yeah, write it all out. What about uh, this, this guest asks about consumer devices used for tracking sleep. Do you have one or any that you would recommend? No, um, because every single consumer device that has been tested independent of the company, right? So the companies will do their own testing and report what they want. Every device that's been tested independent of the company has been shown to have pretty poor validity. Um, the good news is, the good news is that there's so much interest in this that companies keep on investing in it. And there's more startup companies that are like putting their energy and trying to get things right. So even though I say today, there's not a good commercial device to tell you, yeah, you got 7.7 .7 hours of sleep last night. Like none of them are gonna be able to tell you that with great accuracy. That doesn't exist now, but it could in three years, could in, in five years. Maybe there's even something in the pipeline. Um, I thought Apple was going to come out with a, a product, and so now it seems maybe it's a little delayed. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, so we'll see. What about uh, we have two questions um, that focus on narcolepsy? Um, I'll give you both of them. They're slightly different directions on each, but uh, one is, can people that are diagnosed with narcolepsy grow out of that? 
by establishing better sleep habits. And then the other asks if people with narcolepsy have longer REM cycles. Yeah, great question. Um, the second one is, is easier. They do have longer uh, REM sleep cycles and narcolepsy is a disorder of the brain switch that turns REM sleep on versus turns it off. That's sort of the definition of the disorder. Um, the, the part of, can you grow out of it? Um, I can't say any of that with, uh, definitively. What I can tell you is that every single sleep disorder that's been studied is exacerbated by poor sleep habits or, or by going through periods where you're not getting much sleep. Every single sleep disorder is exacerbated. Same thing with every single anxiety and mood and, and depressive disorder. For example, panic attacks. This is, there's a classic study on this. They took people with panic attack disorder and they got them to sleep normally and like no one had a panic attack in the coming week versus another group, they had them pull one all nighter and 40% of them had a panic attack in the coming week. So sleep disorder or keeping to good sleep habits consistently is really important for minimizing the symptoms almost any disorder you have, even chronic pain. There's now a lot of evidence that the neural switches in experiencing really bad pain versus kind of acceptable pain kind of overlap with some of the sleep switches. And so if you're cutting back on sleep, it exacerbates the pain that you feel. Everything hurts more if you're not getting good sleep. So fascinating. Um, we, I will make a quick note. We have a few questions that have come in about uh, a recording of this event. Um, we do, uh, we, or we are recording this event. Uh, one person in particular, I appreciate this. I know you will too, Dr. Skull. And they asked uh, if we could give them the recording so they could pass it to their college student uh, to, to look, look at it as well. So we will send that out uh, in a follow-up email. So all of you can, uh, can stand by uh, for that. Uh, here's an interesting one. Uh, it asks about the impact of altitude on sleep. That is so fascinating. There, there was a guy I worked with at Emory who, who did that stuff. He, he would go and actually do climbs. Um, not, I don't think at Everest, but other climbs. And he would do actual sleep recordings at, at high levels of, of altitude. The biggest change is with your oxygenation levels, right? In which you'd expect. But if you're getting lower levels of oxygenation, the difference is when you're asleep, you don't have as much muscular control to try to breathe in deeper and to um, at, um, amplify how much oxygen you're getting. So you're actually spending a lot longer, you know, six hours, seven hours, eight hours of sleep where you're at a lower level of oxygenation than you would be if you were awake. Wow, that's interesting. Um, I grew up in Denver, actually, so I, I know a little bit about altitude myself. That's fascinating. Um, okay, how about, uh, let, we'll circle back just a tiny bit um, on something you touched on a few minutes ago, and sorry, I'm just kind of going through these one after another, but it, it, uh, it asks about night mode on phones and computers. How effective would you say that night mode is? It's certainly better than not using it. So if your device has night mode, then you should use it and you should set it to automatically turn on, let's say at 9 p.m. You know, something like that. That would be perfect. Um, the physiology of it is actually really quite fascinating. So over thousands and millions of, of years of evolution of the eye and circadian rhythms, our brain learned, it evolved to detect sunlight and trigger all these cascading of events of feeling alert. So when the sun is rising, hey, you better wake up because you got to go hunting for the day or you got to avoid predators and so forth. Okay, we're all good with that. But what's key here is that all of our wonderful devices that we have in the 21st century emit light at a similar wavelength as the sun. So it has the same physiological effect on our brains 
as just the sun rising. So it increases activity in the regions involved in like being alert. And maybe you've heard that it also suppresses things like melatonin. Melatonin is a natural hormone that rises in the evening and helps us to feel sleepy at night. But light exposure, because it thinks it's the sun, right? It decreases, it suppresses that melatonin and it increases the alerting chemicals in our brain. We have a few people that have asked, uh, I think three or four of these actually that have come through that ask if you have recommendations for people who wake up in the middle of the night and then have a hard time going back to sleep. Yeah, I know that is really, really hard. Um, my recommendation is to control everything you can control with the knowledge that the older you get with each passing decade, that's gonna happen a little bit more and more out of your control. So here's what you can control. First thing you can control is, are you going to bed early enough? Are you just kind of stuck in your ways? No, everyone's going to bed at 10 or 11 p.m. even though I'm feeling sleepier and I know I'm gonna wake up early. Maybe adopt an, an earlier bedtime that's, that's strongly encouraged by the sleep medicine community. So that's, that's number one. Number two is think of what you're putting into your body in the evening that then might lead to more awakenings. And here are a few things, a heavy meal, right? Man, I love pizza night, but I do not sleep as well on pizza night. I'm going to wake up more often. And really well-designed studies have shown that if you switch from a diet that's kind of higher in the saturated fats to a diet that's higher in fiber, sleep quality improves. All right, similarly, thinking about what we're putting into our body at night, what are you drinking? You enjoy some nice uh, water for dinner or you, you know, wine, beers, so forth. We know that alcohol, even just a little bit. Uh, so the rule of thumb is one drink for females, two drink for males, all depending on body weight, of course, uh, is sufficient to wake you up earlier. And you might trick yourself and, oh, I'm, I'm just having one, one glass of wine. It's no big deal. I, yeah, it's kind of not, except if you're waking up a lot, you know, before you want to, I really encourage you to take a break from that for like five days. And if you're not sleeping any better, ah, Skullin was wrong, you know, go back to enjoying your, your nice Cabernet or whatever. Um, but if you are sleeping better, take that as a note that's that's meaningful and it doesn't mean that you don't ever have to celebrate it's, it's just be conscientious of when and how and you know like me with my friday pizza diet i know that's going to come at a little bit of a cost so those are a few things that we can control i'm sure some of these we've gotten some of these questions about dreaming um and i'm sure <laughs> you know, goes down a really long path and you could probably talk for hours about this, but some people are asking about, you know, if, if they have violent nightmares or, you know, those types of very vivid dreams, um, you know, does that indicate anything or just kind of your thoughts on, on that sort of thing? Okay, great question. Um, the first thing that I know is that if you're experiencing um, persistent nightmares that, are bothersome, you want them to end. There are treatments for that. So there's something called image, imagery rehearsal therapy. And most, um, most sleep specialists will know this. Most uh, cognitive behavioral therapists will know this. They'll be able to apply the treatment and it is really effective. I mean, the, the original clinical trials were published in JAMA. It's, it's really effective. So you can do something about those nightmares. Uh, the other question is, when you have these nightmares, do you find that you're acting out your dreams? Do you actively, you know, if you have a nightmare of fighting pirates, does your bed partner notice that you're actually swinging your fist back and forth? Do you actually get up and walk over to, to the window, roll it up as if you're gonna dive out into the water? And if that's the case, again, I'd, I'd say you want to make an appointment with a sleep specialist. It's possible that signals a, um, a condition where you would want to treat it. I mean, uh, if you're acting out dreams, 
that can be very um, consequential to, to the bed partner. There have been people have, there's bad stories. People have gotten hurt from that. Uh, another thing that you, you touched on a little bit, um, so you might be able to kind of fly through this, but we have a few questions about, um, well, I think I can lump a lot of these together, Dr. Skull, and there, there's questions about taking melatonin supplements, um, you know, bedtime teas. Um, so, you know, one person in particular says, can you take too much melatonin? And then another says, you know, should I take some type of nighttime tea or, or something like that? Do you, do you have kind of general recommendations on those things? Uh, melatonin, that's a fantastic question. The good news about melatonin is it's really not going to harm you. Uh, it's, it's super safe. The bad news about melatonin is that it's almost never used correctly. It's all over the counter and a physician is never recommending it saying, take it at this time, this dosage. It's almost never used correctly. Most people will just pop some right before they get in bed, help them fall asleep. That has almost no benefit in placebo controlled studies. Melatonin is uh, much better used to reset your circadian rhythm. So for example, if you're going on a trip, you're flying to Hawaii or Europe or whatever, crossing a bunch of time zones and you wanna minimize jet lag, use melatonin to do that. If you wanna use it as a sleep aid, again, it it has a little bit of effect, but really not much effect. It's, it's not the best thing you can be doing. But if you're going to use it as that, you actually want to take it a couple hours before going to bed. Like I said, almost no one takes it, it correctly or taking it right at bed. You know, you take it, you know, a few hours before bed. And, you know, if you want to have another small dosage right before bed, that's okay. But it's, it's really the timing is everything when it comes to melatonin. How about so what was the um, other question? It was about tea at, at night. That's yeah, right. you know, it's it's the same. I'm assuming that this isn't caffeinated tea to, to begin with, um, because if it is, then the answer is clear. You know, you probably shouldn't do. Um, if it's not caffeinated tea, I, I suggest uh, same thing as the folks who are enjoying a glass of wine with with dinner. Um, I challenge you to take four or five days away from it. And if it's, you see no change in your sleep quality, say, whatever, Skellen, I'm back at it. I enjoy my tea. I love it. And, and I'll say, fine, fantastic. <laughs> Keep sleeping well. But if you discover, you know, maybe that thing that I really, really desperately don't want to give up in my life, that thing I really, really love, maybe it is kind of what's holding me back from thriving. So yeah, that would be my challenge. One other person asked about essential oils and if those help with sleep. Yeah, you know, you'll find a, some a number of stuff online, and, and there's some even hospitals that are actually uh, doing things like that, like the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic, Mayo Clinic is fantastic. It it actually cares about how um, patients are, are sleeping while, while they're staying there. And you know, maybe a bunch of hospitals will say they do, but the Mayo Clinic actually takes clear steps to try to get their patients to sleep. And one of the things that they offer is basically different forms of aromatherapy. Now, how effective is it? There's been a couple studies that have suggested maybe it helps. Um, my opinion is it's not going to hurt you, so it's safe, but also that we know better ways to improve your sleep. So I uh, keep doing it if you love it. That's fantastic. But I challenge you to get out a pad of paper and a pen, keep it by your nightstand and write out everything on your mind before you, you go to bed. I, I, I think you might find that could be more effective. Let's also, uh, let's get a definitive answer on this too. Again, it's something that you you know, touched on a, a bunch of times, but, but we're still getting, I think people want, you know, like a specific answer to um, exactly how many hours of sleep you would say someone should have on a nightly basis. Yeah. Okay. Great question. The, um, the consensus recommendation of all the associated sleep societies and medicine folks, the research folks, is that adults 
should get between seven to nine hours of sleep on average. That was the consensus they were able to come to because that they say that eight is almost certainly optimal, but there are cases where people don't need eight hours of sleep. There are cases where people need seven hours of sleep and you know, getting seven versus eight, that they do just the same. So they give a range, but what's often missed with that range, people see that range is like, oh, okay, so I only need seven. They said seven to nine, I only need seven. Well, not really. There's just as many people who actually need nine hours of sleep as do seven hours of sleep. And if you're someone who needs eight and a half, nine hours of sleep, and you're getting seven, seven and a half, you're actually restricting your sleep every single night. And you, you might be exhausted all the time. And you think, oh, I'm getting seven and a half hours of sleep. What's the big deal? Yeah, but you might need more. So my challenge to everyone who says, hey, I'm, I'm a six hour sleeper, or I'm a seven hour sleeper. Okay. All right. Give me one week. Give me one week where you are going to allot an extra hour of time in bed. Um, earlier, later, maybe earlier is a little bit easier to try to adapt. Try that for one week. And if you're not sleeping more, and if you're not happier that you change your sleep patterns, say, whatever, Skellen, I'm going back to my six hours to my seven hours. I say, hey, great, man, I, I really admire you. I wish I was a six hour sleeper. I, I thrive off of eight hours and 15 minutes of sleep. Um, so that's my challenge. And, and say one more thing to back that up. A number of years ago, there was this big study done on four peop 400 people uh, who identified as I'm a seven hour sleeper, that's all I need. They took these 400 people and they got each of them to get one more hour of sleep each night. So it's become eight hours of sleep. Then at the end of the study, they said, okay, so how'd it turn out? People were happier, fewer mood disturbances. They felt better. They felt like their brain was more you know, active, more there. They didn't want to go back. Here's a, and let's do, we'll do a couple more. And then I want to be, I want to be respectful of uh, Dr. Scullin's time. But um, uh, this, this is another one that I, I personally think is super fascinating. Um, and we, we haven't really touched on it yet is um, if there's a sleep position, you know, like on your back or on your side or something like that, that uh, would improve the quality of your sleep, perhaps. Great question. Again, uh, I think the biggest thing you got to think of is how does sleep position affect sleep apnea? Now, we didn't touch on this at all today, but it's really important. There is a condition called sleep apnea where you either stop breathing completely while you sleep for 10 seconds or more, or your breathing is reduced by like 50%. And this doesn't just happen once at night. <clears throat> for a lot of folks, it'll happen 50 times at night. That's actually only considered mild. And then you can have moderate and severe, which would be 200 times a night or like 400, 500 times a night. This is really, really hard on your heart and it's really, really hard on your brain. As it turns out, sleep apnea is considerably worse if you're sleeping on your back than if you're sleeping on your side. So if there is an answer to what is the correct sleeping position, it's saying, you know, for at least breathing while you sleep, it's best to be sleeping on your side. I'll also tell you a personal story. So my dad, my dad is, is, is a really fit guy. He's, he's really health conscious, but he was a snorer. And that is the number one signal that someone has sleep apnea. If you're a big time snorer, if your spouse is a big time snorer, you got to go get them checked out. This is a, this is really important to get it treated, get it fixed because the the, the five year uh, lookout for their health, for heart disease and and everything, it's dramatically different if you get it treated versus if you just say no, I don't want to think about sleep apnea. So get it treated, get it diagnosed. Uh, my dad, who's <laughs> fit and healthy, he was a snorer and. <clears throat> You can have really very mild levels of sleep apnea 
if you're doing certain things like sleeping on your back. And my dad was a back sleeper. So I got him to sleep on his side. Snoring's gone. What about, um, here's, a, here's a question about uh, genetic predisposition to having poor sleep quality. Is that something that you, it, does that exist? You know, can you be genetically predisposed to not being able to sleep well? Yeah, uh, fascinating question. It, the angle that sleep genetics has normally gone on is, can you have a genetic predisposition so that sleep deprivation doesn't affect you as much. And it turns out that there's a genetic mutation, it's called the DEC2 mutation, discovered a few years ago, where some people can get five hours of sleep or maybe even four hours of sleep a night and not be impacted at all. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know this for sure, but I'm pretty sure I know two people in my life have the DEC2 mutation. Uh, they're short sleepers, four or five hours a night, but that doesn't necessarily tell you that they have it, right? There's some people who just don't get enough sleep. The other signals are, these are people who drink zero caffeine. They, their body just can't stand it. They run on high enough energy. It is, if you pour something else in the tank, it just explodes, right? No caffeine. They're super high energy, super sociable individuals. And, um, oh, what's the other thing? Oh, I'm totally blanking on the other thing. Uh, but they're just extremely outgoing, no caffeine needed ever. Um, they're often very highly productive, highly successful individuals. And so people are beginning to study this DEC2 mutation and what does it mean? And can we somehow use it for all the population only need five hours of sleep? I don't know, you know, check back in a hundred years. Um, okay, uh, let's see, let's, well, I'm gonna do, this is a really, really quick one. Um, and, and I think the answer, it's, it's a kind of a question, but I do think that it's important for possibly some of the parents and, and such on here. Uh, someone said they're a student that is coming into Baylor, an incoming student, and they're interested in what you're doing and the lab and being a part of that. Um, so if there are parents on here listening, they have current Baylor students, um, you know, should they reach out to you or, or how does that process work? If, if the student is interested in, in joining the lab as a research assistant, fantastic. The, maybe the very best part of my job is, is mentoring students. I absolutely love it. And, you know, hopefully you saw that from, you know, the highlighting of some of my past graduates. Uh, the best thing for them to do is get in their freshman year and kick butt. You know, do great in your classes, show that you can manage your time well, show that you can manage your life well, because that's evidence that lab, that's a big commitment, that you're able to add on something to that. So we don't consider applications from freshmen. We tell them, just focus on your classes, do a really well in your freshman year, get off to a good start. And then in the sophomore year, we have an application on our website. So if this is the type of stuff they're interested in, you know, check us out on our lab website. You can Google skull and sleep or something like that. And something similar will, should pop up. And you know, check us out and then you know, see the application. And you know, students can email me as, as well, happy to do that. Um, Tell them to take intro neuroscience, that it's a great course. It's, it's a team taught course. So four different neuroscience professors um, teach a section of the course on the areas where they're an expert. And so, you know, I teach a little bit about basic neuron function, but then I spend a week talking about memory and then another week's talking about sleep. So I teach that every single semester, you know, tell them to take intro neuroscience and uh, come and say hi to me. Yeah, I think if anybody takes anything away from this, it's that you have no passion whatsoever for, you know, all this stuff. No, I, I think this, is, this has been um, fantastic. Uh, okay, so I'll leave you with this one. This will be um, the, the, last, the last question. And some of the others that we didn't get to, I, I apologize. A lot of them, 
you know, I think we touched on a little bit and hopefully if you can go back and look at the recording, I think, I think we touched on a lot of it. Um, and plus, again, I just want to be respectful of Dr. Scullin's time today. Um, so we had a, we had a question about, um, it goes back to, you were talking about those big meals and eating, although this person asks if, if they have a really high metabolism and they, you know, wake up in the middle of the night and they're really hungry and, you know, or even just right before bed, you're really, really hungry. Um, do you have, you know, kind of dietary tips for kind of best ways to then not throw off, you know, your sleep patterns as associated with that? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. What a what an interesting question. And I, like, first off, I'm getting like a little selfish thinking, man, I wish I still had a high metabolism. I had such a high metabolism when I was in my 20s. And, you know, it's just gone downhill since kids. Okay. Um, you know, I don't have a great answer for you. I, I just won't. I, I think monitoring how eating at night, how different meals, different, different types of food affects whether you wake up hungry in the middle of the night. I think that's step one. Um, another step is make sure that you bring it up with your, um, with your primary care physician and the PCP might say, oh yeah, that's, you got a high metabolism, nothing we can do about it. Or maybe it's a signal of, well, you know what? Maybe we should talk about this or let's just get you screening and get this test here. So I'd encourage talking to the PCP uh, about that and just tracking how, what do I, what I eat at night and at what times and maybe also how you work out. So is the workout occurring a little too late at night? If you're working out late at night, then you get your heart rate up and it's kind of hard to bring it down um, to get good sleep. Eh, yeah, of course it drops down, but does it drop down as much as it normally would? And then you know, the other thing about working out is, you know, you're becoming dehydrated. So what do you do when you're dehydrated? You rehydrate it. And what do you do if you have too much water? You're waking up in the middle of the night to do something about that, right? So if part of it's driven by the exercise routine, also evaluate that um, afternoon exercise, morning exercise is recommended by sleep specialists over evening or night exercise. Awesome. That's great. Super helpful. Um, and again, uh, can't thank you enough, Dr. Skolan, for taking some time, walking us through all of that. Um, I think that, you know, I, I hate to speak for an entire audience, but I personally had not heard that presentation before and I thought it was um, really great. So thank you okay. for, for taking the time for us. Great. Well, thank you all for, for attending and, you know, feel free to send me an email if you have any follow-up questions. If your question didn't get an answer, I'd, I'd be happy to, to respond that way. And um, yeah, it was, it was great being here and, and virtually meeting. So um, I will say just on that note, um, because you offered um, the, uh, the email address for Dr. Skolin, for anybody listening, if you have pen and paper handy, um, it is again, Michael, that's M-I-C-H-A-E-L underscore Skolin, uh, S-C-U-L-L-I-N at baylor.edu. Um, so if you do have any lingering questions, but again, uh, so thankful for everybody that tuned in today. We appreciate you very much. And uh, please keep your eyes open um, for uh, future events as we'll keep sending those your way, both in person and virtual. And now we're getting back to some of the norm as well. So everybody have a great rest of your week and uh, hopefully have a great night of sleep tonight as well.